the, the next presentation uh, is by Michael Klein, and I, I think it would be an offense to introduce you because you Oops. don't need one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, hopefully I'll be able to get through and not delay you too much from, from, from coffee. I, I always feel inspired when I come to this part of the world because um, usually this visit is associated with going to India. And uh, the last time I, I came through, I think I highlighted this exhibition that took place at ver various places. And in fact, there's a book about the influence of the Muslim art in, 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 in India. So I just show this, this one slide, incredible book. And uh, occasionally pages from this book come up for sale and they typically go for a million dollars. And uh, they, they are distributed around the world in museums. So I just draw your attention to, to this. Okay, can, can I have the next slide or I can do that myself maybe? Let's okay, so um, I used a title that from a couple of years ago, basically. And as I get older, more and more, I go back to look at the old literature of what inspired me when I was young. And I think I'll take you through a few slides that inform my life and, and hope as a scientist, and, and hopefully some of that will uh, rub off on some of the younger people that are perhaps watching. So, Happy to be here, and like everybody else, incredibly grateful to Sheikh Saud for having us come here for the past 15 years, and uh, enormous pleasure watching the quality of the conference increase, and uh, finally the impact, uh, which was very obvious when on Friday I went down to visit the universities in Abu Dhabi, with Sheikh Saud and Tony, and it was informative for us, right? We, we uh, had been discouraged, I think, in the past from going anywhere else, but um, it, it's a massive opportunity for RAK if it can link to these universities that already have solid infrastructure for doing material science. So, um, my scientific career began with the head of the Department of Chemistry at Bristol at the time. Um, to get an honours degree, you had to do an undergraduate thesis, and the head of the department was very suspicious of people like me that didn't want to do experiments in the lab. And so he assigned me a couple of papers to read, and then I had to convince him that there was something interesting there for, for me to worry about. So this was the first paper he assigned me. It's uh, by Alan Fowler. Fowler at the time was professor of theoretical physics at Cambridge. Bernal was a young student, J.D. Bernal. And they wrote a paper on the properties of water and ionic solutions. And um, a very profound paper because they went right to the basics and said the properties of water are intimately connected with the electronic structure of the water molecule. And uh, they were smart enough to build a little model and uh, in the end claimed, at least, that they rationalized almost everything that was known. And I think it's important in the modern context, which I hopefully will get to at the end of my talk, about using artificial intelligence. So there was nothing artificial about this intelligence. They were using their own brain and they used big data. They looked at all the available experiments and they tried to rationalize this in terms of a model. And I think this, this set the groundwork for chemical physics almost to the present time, that this, this is what you want to do. You, you try to build a simple model of the way the molecules talk to each other, and then uh, you do computation, in their case by hand, I guess, and, uh, and, and see what, what comes out. The, s the second papers that I was asked to read were these. And, uh, here, uh, John Popel, a young man working with Leonard Jones, his, his advisor, um, also set out to try and explain the properties of water. 
He, he actually did many other things too, but, uh, but this, these were the papers that were assigned to me to read. And uh, interesting thing about Leonard Jones is that uh, if you look through this Trinity College and so on, um, the crucial thing for him was that he, he got married and changed his name, right? From Jones to Leonard Jones. So I discovered this going through the literature because trying to do calculations on solid argon, I discovered the jones Ingham lattice sums in, in mathematical papers. And then I come across this paper by Leonard Jones, and it was a while before I realized it was the same person. But if you go back and look carefully at the paper, there's a footnote by, there's a star by Leonard Jones, and in the footnote it says, formerly Jones. <laughs> so it turns out he took his wife's name, because she was aristocracy. And then after that he was made a professor. So I don't know whether the marriage had anything to do with him being a professor, but it's interesting to go back to the history. Uh, these two gentlemen, of course, are very famous, and John Popel eventually got a Nobel Prize uh, for doing things not so unrelated to, to what he did there. So an another important seminal paper, which I came across, because um, I'm talking about 1960, but this was more of a dream for me, that um, people in the United States had managed to calculate the properties of a liquid using a computer. Uh, we did have a computer at, at that time at the university, and I did play with it, but about the best I could do on the computer was do quadrature, do integrals, and I didn't remember calculating the third virial coefficient of argon. It wasn't worth publishing, but at least I did get to use a computer. In those days, the computer had valves, and before you could use it, you had to make sure they were all working, you replace some of the valves, and you talk to the computer with pieces of paper with holes in it. Uh, which, and these pieces of paper would break when you tried to feed them into the computer. And, and anyway, but that's a story from another time. The crucial thing about this paper is that um, these guys did Monte Carlo calculations, and I'm excited to see Dan in the audience because for years and years and years, we referred to this as the Metropolis algorithm. And I've been taking every opportunity I can to try and correct history here. This is a rare paper because there are two women as authors. Instead of just being in the acknowledgments, they're actually authors. And it's a pioneering paper, as you can see from the number of citations. And uh, I have this, this idea that uh, an algorithm is not invented by a committee. Somebody came up with the idea. There's too many people on this paper in the author list. And my research has led me to believe that Ariana Rosenbluth, and perhaps with Marshall's help, perhaps, um, and she died just recently, um, that these were the guys that invented the algorithm. Uh, Don was at a conference with me in 1985 when Bernie Alder stood up and announced that he invented the Monte Carlo method. And uh, he was then challenged just to explain how he did it. And it wasn't very convincing, was it, Don? The main well, we shouldn't make fun of Bernie because he did great, great things. But, but this was unreasonable, I think. Anyway, but then there's this other thing that uh, they do acknowledge in this paper, discussions with, with Alder. And uh, there's some other rumors going around that uh, other famous people had perhaps hinted that there could be ways to do this. Anyway, so it, after I had already finished my PhD, this, this, this paper came out, which was seminal, I think. It surpri has surprisingly few citations for a seminal paper, but this was the first that our field of chemical physics or physical chemistry, uh, somebody had modeled a liquid on a computer. And uh, it was the Anisur Rahman, and uh, unfortunately uh, didn't receive the, the, in his lifetime the real credit. The, I mean, those of us that knew him, of course, en enjoyed him and honored him, but he did many things, including being involved in the first 
well, one of the first simulations of a protein and teaching the people that wrote that code how to do it. And um, Anyway, so that, 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 that's Anise. So very soon after that, Frank Stillinger encouraged Anise to do a calculation of molecular dynamics of water. So we went from atoms to molecules um, around about 1970. That's about when I entered the field. Um, I won't belabor the point, but basically I also had to co collaborate with somebody in the national lab because that's the only place there were computers that were useful. And I wrote a paper with Bill Hoover, uh, 50th anniversary last year, of using Monte Carlo methods to compare with uh, so-called smart ways of doing things, summing many body diagrams and trying to work out what they really contain. It, it took a little bit longer, 30 years from, from the Bernal Fowler paper, well, 50 years from Bernal paper, but many years on from the, the, the paper of Anise, that I, I would say this is a culmination of human intelligence. So we tried to fit a huge amount of data with low-level computers, and, uh, but constrained by assumptions about the functional form of the way molecules talk to each other. Very, very successful work and particularly valuable for people that model biological systems. Um, another seminal event was this work by Michele Paranello and Roberto Carr that said, well, we don't need to use empirical models for the forces between atoms or molecules. We can perhaps calculate them by electronic structure theory, which just because of the demands of computer time at, at this stage meant using primitive uh, versions of density functional theory. But an incredibly important paper psychologically, if nothing else, that we can build our models from quantum mechanics, and if the system is not too, too complicated, we can uh, then do dynamical studies on the fly. Lots of things happened. Um, Michaelius contributed new, new twists and turns of algorithms over the years and continues to do that. But there's another, other important advances in density functional theory some where people just fit lots of data and others where people try to use constraints implied by the formal quantum mechanics to get better so-called functionals so that the density functional theory is more precise. So this is a, a famous paper in the field, um, generalized gradient approximation made simple. And a few months ago when I looked at it, 124,000 citations. It must be close to 150,000 citations by now um, from my colleague John Perdue at Temple. But anyway, if, if we go fast forward, I mean, these, these gentlemen have all continued to contribute. In this case, I put Roberto up there along with Michele. And, and that brings us to the next twist in the road where Michele published some papers or, or already 15 years ago, saying that um, we need to be a little bit smarter about how we do this because sometimes the potential energy surface you're trying to explore is very complicated and therefore um, we shouldn't try to constrain it in any way and that maybe just the data of can be used without any constraint on the nature of the interactions to fit it. Now, this wasn't invented by Michele. I mean, I think he was inspired by work from Scheffler's group. And even before that, uh, people that were interested in the absorption of atoms and molecules on surfaces had tried to use these methods to simplify the computations. But nevertheless, for our field, that was insightful. So John Perdue, as I said, has been going on refining and refining the way we do this and getting what I would say a more faithful density functional theory approaches. And the most recent one that's got some popularity, Umesh has been involved in 
applications, right? And this turns out to be pretty useful over an incredible range of materials, even including superconductors, um, oxides, and I'm, I'm not talking about that at all. But th this general approach of, that came out from John Perdue has, has been, just turned out to be very powerful. It's, it's not the final answer, but it, it's uh, very decent. And surprisingly, uh, how broadly applicable it is. So I've been interested in water, as I said, since 1960, when that's what I was told to think about. And it, it, it is astonishing how accurate it is, given that the energies you're dealing with are so small compared with chemical bonds, where the typical way you think of using quantum mechanics is to make and break chemical bonds. And this is just uh, electrostatics and van der Waals forces. And it, right now, we, we can get very decent accuracy of something like water. But the world has changed. As I said, the uh, fashionable thing right now is to use artificial intelligence and machine learning. I would say the examples I've given up till now have really used implicitly big data as the way we inform the parameters of the potentials. We don't just look at one system, we look at many, many, many systems, but we still constrained what we do by our imagination on what the intermolecular forces should look like. I, I did put uh, a, a bunch of names there. So I was fortunate, maybe it's four or five years ago now, maybe it's even six years ago, that Department of Energy uh, came to us and said we would like to understand very simple systems in great detail. Quite unusual for a funding agency to actually ask us to do fundamental work, right? <laughs> and, and so, and I mean that seriously. They, they, they said we have some very di difficult problems and rather than just seeing billions of years of computer time being used on models that are really not good enough. Can you look at some simple systems and explore in great detail? That gave the opportunity for us to, to assemble a group of 10 pretty, pretty good people to start to work in that area. I, I, have, I can claim nothing at all for, for the work that was done by these people on building the neural network models. But uh, Wina and uh, uh, Roberto and Li Fen Zhang, who was a joint student between Roberto and Wina, they, they built these um, powerful tools using machine learning algorithms. And I'm, I'm not going to talk so much about what they actually did, but it they won the Bell Gordon Prize at supercomputing two years ago. They were able to model literally millions and millions of atoms. So let me just say in words what, what they managed to achieve. So you use essentially a data set that you build, a training set, by doing many, many ab initio calculations and building a huge data set. Then this data set is fit using what are now reasonably standard protocols. And that enables you to build a classical model of this data set. You're not constrained by fitting, for example, two parameters. You can have an infinite, given a big computer, you can have an infinite almost number of parameters. And so they, they've essentially laid out the groundwork for how you do that. And if you have smart enough programmers, you can use the biggest machine on the planet and, uh, and then run to your heart's content. And they highlighted, I think they ran four, four million water molecules and they run, I don't know, hundreds of millions of atoms and look at dislocations moving in crystals and things like that. So fabulous achievement. So on our side, again, I continue to be interested in water, so we we put out a paper just recently on using these kinds of tools and also refining the electronic structure theory to see how well we can model water. This is again part of this DOE mandate. Um, but if you see in the title there, we said using Jacob's Ladder. So that caused me 
twigging something in my brain, remembering seeing uh, this picture by Blake in, in the Tate Gallery in London. So I went back to look at Jacob's Ladder. And what caught my attention immediately in, in the middle of this image is actually Isaac Newton, or at least Blake's version of Isaac Newton. And why do I say that? Because he also, Blake also, there's a painting in the Tate from William Blake of Isaac Newton. But the commentary on the Blake surprised me. I, I don't know if it, Tate Gallery website says Blake was critical of Newton's approach. Um, there he is worrying about his science, oblivious to the beauty of nature around him. Well, I guess that's one interpretation you could make. Um, fortunately, in the arts, there doesn't seem to be a unique interpretation of things. But if we then go back to the image I showed you, so I posed the question for you, was Blake it communicated from heaven and he's coming down to earth? Or was he descending from heaven to come and save us all? So I just pose that as a question. Both. <laughs> Both. Anyway, I, I, I had not seen anybody else comment on this, but I, I thought it would be relevant. Okay, so um, 60 years plus um, since the Bernal Fowler paper. This is the kind of progress we've made. We, we have paper, I think it came out last week in Nature Communications, so they continue to be puzzled. And this was, again, employing the toolbox that I just mentioned. Here it is, just came out. So now, um, I don't think people here are particularly interested in water, but it just served as a vehicle to highlight the kinds of toolbox that, that we have available. So macromolecules, that's the title I gave of my talk. And uh, I had cause a couple of years ago to go back and read the proceedings of a Faraday discussion meeting, 1958, where J.D. Bernal wrote the introductory lecture. Uh, and he mentioned that perhaps the title of the structure and arrangements of macromolecules, uh, he said maybe the title should have been Configurations of Close Interactions of Macromolecules and Their Expression in Solution, Liquid Crystals, and Solid State. This is an incredible volume, actually. Uh, so this is one of the things I think we've lost by just going to the internet for our papers. I mean, if the old days we walked into the library and you wandered around and you picked a random thing off the shelf and you browsed through it. And so, how, how do you find these old things now? I mean, yes, if you know what you're looking for, you can find it, but... Um, so this beautiful picture here in, from Bernal's lab, right? From Picasso. Okay, so Bernal, as those of us in chemical physics know that he didn't have a computer, but he made an analog model of a liquid, and from that was able to extract the radial distribution function. But that's not really what I'm going to talk about. So this Faraday discussion was really incredible. Um, it, it highlights, or he highlights in his introduction, the work of Rosalind Franklin. And, you know, uh, these days she's been rehabilitated in a sense. But this volume contained two papers by her with incredible uh, collaborators. So, um, tragically, you know, she died a long time ago, e before this meeting took place, in fact. So, so this is an example of why one should use one's own laptop, right? So this, these slides have become bastardized by the software. Um, so, she, um, she's on a paper with Aaron Klug, uh, maybe it's, it's here. So the late Rosalind Franklin is on this paper with Aaron Klug, where they did tobacco mosaic virus and to show that the virus is encapsulated in a helical uh, assembly of protein around it. And um, 
again, that in itself is fascinating, and J.D. Bernal highlights this as an incredible discovery. Um, and this brings me to the second paper of hers, which is about Teflon. And uh, the Teflon, they highlight because what happens if you have a chain-like molecule, in the, in the case of Teflon, it's a fluorinated uh, carbon, and the chains line up like you would pick up a stack of pencils. And if you heat the crystal, what kind of disorder can arise? So the first kind of disorder you would get in plastic crystals would be rotation about the long axis. But you can also have translation up and down of these chains. They're packed together. They can twist up and down. And they make the case that there's actually a, a coupled motion of twisting and translating. So, and they discuss the effect on the diffraction pattern of that kind of disorder. But they didn't have computer graphics back then, so they went to the workshop. And if you look at the paper, this is the image of their illustration of what twisted translational motion is. So, so I guess they went down to the workshop and got a screwdriver <laughs> and took, took a photograph. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, they, uh, they um, understood well um, what kind of disorder. So this, this paper has intrigued me for a long time, and uh, it's already more than 20 years ago when we, we modeled this on a computer. Uh, so I was, I, I was actually obsessed with the fact that as you, what does this solid look like here that is connected to the melt? Because the melt's going to be entangled, and the translational structure is going to disappear. And at room temperature, Teflon, is, is just here, which is fascinating for people that use Teflon in a construction mode, because if, if the thing heats, it's going to go through a transition. If you cool, it's going to go through another transition. And most people that use this lab temperature uh, are not aware of this. They just assume it's the same stuff. But I, I don't have time to go into the details of, of what we found, but we, we published a paper on this a number of years ago. Anyway, if, if you continue thumbing through this, this issue, there's a paper on liquid crystals by Sir Charles Frank, and I'm sure Don knows this paper. And uh, again, 1958, theory of liquid crystals, and, and I, I don't know to what extent that paper inspired Don to do this, but uh, I mean, he... <laughs> I mean, there was on Saga before that, but... But anyway, so Don did a, a whole body of work on liquid crystals, which was seminal, influential, and uh, just just fantastic. More hair there, Don. <laughs> so this this volume has yet another incredible thing. Andrew Keller, Andrew Keller, who discovered that when long chain polymers crystallize, they must fold. Totally unexpected. No idea why this guy didn't get a Nobel Prize. I mean, this was a phenomenal discovery. I mean, a discovery that, why didn't these chains just do that? But they fold back on themselves. And uh, as he says here, from the, the minimal observation of the thickness of the crystals, the repeat length that comes out of the diffraction is you know, 10 times shorter than the length of the polymer. So they must fold. And uh, that's uh, what came out of that. We know the phase diagram now. There is a, under pressure, there is a rotator phase, so to call, so called. But normally it goes from entangled melt to a folded state. Well, there was a theory of that. It came out a little bit later by Frank and Mario Tozzi. Um, which I find impossible to understand. I've, I've spent hours on this paper, but given that it's by F.C. Frank, I'm certain it's correct, <laughs> but I, I couldn't understand their rationale. But this one I understood. So then there's another paper here, which explains the crystallization in, in terms of a model, but it, it's, it's certainly substantially correct. 
There's been other works in this field, and particularly by Rutledge at MIT, but in many respects, that's just elaborating, I think, on the basic ideas that are already around. So that brings me to uh, the work that was done in my group use, using models of, of the type that Baron Smith has used in surfactants and other areas where we use human intelligence, I would say, Baron, right? <laughs> so <laughs> rather than artificial intelligence. And uh, to, to build simple models of complex, uh, complex things. So I had a Canadian postdoc, Kyle Hall, in my group, and I put him to work trying to look at the crystallization of polymer melts. I mean, we have sufficient computation now where this is accessible for the first time. And uh, w just watching the nucleation of uh, that comes out of uh, these things. So I won't dwell on that. I don't know if this video will work. Oh, it, 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 maybe it will. So this is just time lapse as order starts to develop. We, of course, use an algorithm to decide where there's a patch of order. And uh, trying to bring the, the crystallizing nucleus in, in the middle of a uh, simulation cell. So, and I, in, in the particular cell we were using, there were two such uh, nuclei that formed. And uh, just to imagine what is happening, you, you have an entangled, entangled mess. And so I just picked one chain out of the whole ensemble to see how that folds. Now, it will be folding against itself, but it will also be folding against other members of the ensemble. And when it's close packed, the color changes to red. And uh, so this would be for the whole length of the trajectory from the start to the finish. And indeed, the macromolecule folds on itself, as Andrew Keller discovered many, many years ago. And at the end, uh, this particular one is, is very ordered. But it, just, it doesn't only order against itself. It orders against neighboring molecules, of course. So I, I think we, all we've succeeded in doing, Don, is verifying the, the paper that you had many years ago. Anybody interested, that we, we've published a bunch of papers, and the people involved, Wataru Shinoda from Japan and, and Kyle, Kyle decided to leave science, unfortunately. Well, unfortunately, good for him. He decided to go into modeling the market, I think, and much more rewarding, <laughs> and uh, wish him well. So that, uh, how much time, Don? Two minutes? OK, so I'll, I'll go very fast. I won't say much. So where, where do we go with this background? So I would say in the last. Uh, Three years, two years, three years, we've been trying to bring these neural network potentials to the problems I just outlined of macromolecules. And uh, we, we don't have any publications, a few abstracts at meetings. And uh, what we've basically been doing in, in a simple case of polyethylene, we've done much more than that, but polyethylene um, essentially building a database of all conceivable small organic molecules, including ones with single bonds, double bonds, triple bonds, and, and, and more. And then we went back to a problem that we published in, in Nature 20 odd years ago, where we took, using ab initio molecular dynamics, we took a simple polyethylene strand, put a trefoil knot in it, tugged the ends to see where the trefoil knot broke. So I thought we will revisit this with modern density functional methods, build a neural network model for the hydrocarbon, and uh, can we do chemistry with a neural network potential? Can we break the bonds, do the pieces move around, and, and make what they should, radicals, and convert methylene groups to methyl groups, and make double bonds and break double bonds? So, we're very close to submitting this for publication, but I, there may be a video. Does the video play? No, it doesn't play. Okay. Can I go back? How do I go back? How do I, how, 
How do I go back? Do you know? The red one? Ah, there you go. So unfortunately, this video didn't work. It would have shown. So the great advantage of the neural network is that we can do 100 simulations of breaking the knot. So we can now get statistics. Was this one event that we saw 20 years ago representative? So the, the discovery that's just come out of this, in a sense, we can reproduce that. Hydrogen atoms can move around. We can make double bonds. We can make methyl groups. But the thing that we didn't realize 20 years ago is the angle bending also has to be activated. We thought it was just the bonds that had to be stretched when the, the chains pass through each other. But in fact, the, it, it's also a stretch involved. So I think when we get statistics on lots and lots of these events of the breaking, the basic idea, the entrance or exit of the knot is the fragile region. And uh, anyway, so what are we doing now? We're looking at more complex polymers. We're seeing the effects of chemical substitution. How does that change the properties? And I think this is going to be a fruitful area. And uh, hopefully, if we ever get together again, I'll be able to tell you where we are. So I'm going to end there. For a nice sort of overview of problems that come back again and again. <laughs> Please. Mike, I really would like to ask you about water. I know you, you thought that nobody should be interested in water here, and I, I think this is very wrong. <laughs> okay. So uh, do you think that there are two kinds of super cold water, and there is a phase transition liquid, <laughs> liquid, liquid <laughs> phase transition? Well, I, I, I didn't explicitly write a paper on two kinds, but I had a physical review letter in 1987 where we took ice, using empirical models, I admit, from that time, and we crushed it. And so we saw the transition that was observed in experiment. And then I'll say two things. We took that amorphous material we made, and we heated it up, and we cooled it down, and we found a different amorphous structure. But we had very limited computer time in 1987, and that's in the paper. Then we did something else, we c compressed it again. We, we took the amorphous ice and we really squashed it. And it recrystallized as ice 8, the interpenetrated structure. And I went rushing across to the lab of the experimentalists and said, keep squeezing it, it's going to recrystallize. They looked at me. <laughs> well, about 20 years after that, Russ Hemley at the geophysical lab has a science paper finding exactly what we found in 1987. So, are there two forms? Well, we found two forms, but we didn't actually look in any detail. So, subsequently, De Benedetti at Princeton has done very, very careful studies. He had a big fight with David Chandler, but I, I'm pretty sure that what he's done, I mean, it's many years later, right? it's 30 years later, I, I, I think. Do you have a comment? That I think it's no, pretty think respectful. Pretty yeah. No, I, I think this is real. But experimentally, of course, not proven yet. Uh, that would be very tough, yes. Very tough. Yeah. Well, why don't you try? Uh, no, not that smart. <laughs> well, I've been, I've been in the game sufficiently long that I don't mind if experimentalists disagree with me. I, I, there was a paper in Nature Physics well, I have a paper, again, from that era, 1988, predicting the structure of ice in the core of the ice planets in the solar system. Thirty years later, there's a paper from the Livermore group saying I was correct. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Thirty years. <laughs> so in this business, you have to have good genes. <laughs> if you're a computer simulator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other part? Any other question? Ben? Okay, so we should... No, Ben, ben, oh. ben, ben and then, then we go for the break. Okay, sorry. Thanks very much. Uh, um, we find knots in polymers in this supramolecular self-assembled systems all the time, and we are very much intrigued how this affects the organization, you know, and the properties. Can your models get, give me an idea? Can they predict, actually? Because it has to do also with the organization, eh? Mm -hmm. so when you have a more global structure versus a more linear structure, it makes a big difference. 
Well, so I think we're on the fringe of being able to answer such right. questions. Yeah. No, really. Um, it would help us a lot, you know, in, 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 in finding out why they behave differently. Yeah, I've been fascinated much of my career with the self-assembly business. Uh, I've done a lot of work on membranes, uh, cell membranes, and things in membranes, and what you do with membranes, and so is Baron. Uh, yeah, I, know. Um, I, I think we're on the fringe of being able to help. Wouldn't you say that? So I'd be very interested in a specific example. Yeah. So, so I, I, I think we're, we're going to stop because we are a little bit over time. Yes, yes, yes. So, yes. so, so uh, let's thank all.